Maybe it's because I don't know what I don't know, but I don't put a ton of processing on my tracks when I mix, and you have noticed. I'm going to answer a viewer question talking about my mixing philosophy and my approach as we unpack a bluesy, swampy New Orleans vibe cue called Grits and Gumbo featuring all recorded instruments, including yours truly on drums on my week 48 vlog check-in. What is happening, everybody? This is Dave Croft. Welcome to week 48 of my 52 cues vlog, where I am committing to writing at least one cue per week for the entire year and coming on to YouTube and talking about it, talking about the process, breaking down the cue, talking about what's going on in the industry, in my life, or anything else like that. Uh, if this is your first time here, thank you so much for joining me. I do appreciate you, however you found me. Uh, if you haven't already, please maybe consider liking and subscribing and all of that stuff. I also want to give a special word of thanks to my Patreon patrons who support helps keep things going here. Much more about my Patreon at the end of the video. If you want to skip over the vlog portion of the video, you can do so. The timestamps are in the description below. And um, before we get started into the vlog, I want to give another word of thanks to everybody who commented from last week's vlog entry. Uh, if you haven't watched that, I, I wasn't actually able to get a cue done last week. And um, Kind of had my little therapeutic moment on YouTube and lots of support from you guys both uh, on the YouTube comments as well as uh, the Patreon comments and all of that. So thank you guys so much. I do appreciate you. But I am I, I am kind of back into the groove. Uh, it has helped to have uh, several days off from the theater gig that I am in the middle of. We uh, we have a Sunday matinee and then we had three days off. And this weekend is really, really packed because starting tomorrow, uh, I have I have a, a double tomorrow on Thursday. And then on Friday, I'm going to a gig four hours away, staying overnight, driving back up four hours back into Florida, going straight to the double on Saturday and then on Sunday. But uh, you got to strike while the iron's hot, right? And when it rains, it pours and all of those, all of those metaphors. Anyway. Uh, but thanks again for all of your support from, from last week's cathartic video. I want to talk about my mixing process because I did get a question from a, from a YouTube, uh, or YouTube comment, uh, Rayborn Johnson, uh, mentioned, he said a couple of questions. I seem to notice every time I watch your videos that you do a very minimal amount of processing on your individual tracks. Is that true? I always see. Uh, I I seem to all always see only a channel EQ on almost every track, and that seems to almost always just be a high pass filter. Not sure what the frequency cutoff is. I find myself often feeling a need to use lots of plugins on both my master bus and my individual tracks, both because I feel the need to carve out space, and because I have so many of them to use. However, I never hear frequency clutter in your tracks. What am I missing? How are you getting such clear miss, uh, mixes with such minimal processing? Well, first of all, Rayborn, thank you so much. I know that you are, you know, you're in the business along, along with us. And to have you comment, thank you so much. I, I do appreciate it. And uh, thank you very much for the kind words about my mixes. My mi I've actually gotten compliments on my mixes uh, from publishers saying that they don't sound like overly processed, too heavy. And I, th I think it's twofold, all right? I think there are, are two reasons for that. And I touched on one of those at the beginning, which is I don't necessarily know what I don't know. I don't come from a mixing background. I don't come from an engineering background. I am very much approaching this as a composer, learning the tools that I need to make good mixes. And I know what it should sound like, I know the reference material or the soundtracks or, or whatever I'm listening to. I, I feel like I know what it should sound like, but I don't 
I'm, I'm not weighted down with the burden of knowledge. And that you kind of touched on that. You know, I have so many of them to use. So I'm not, I don't know everything that I quote unquote should throw into a mix. I have a handful of tools. You mentioned the EQs and I, I, I will throw a compressor, maybe some light reverb. And that's, that's kind of it. And even on, on my Q4 today, it's the same approach. It is some EQs, some compression, because my, my rule of thumb is I always put a compressor on recorded audio. And because this is nearly all recorded audio, I've got compressors on it. Some, some reverb, some parallel compression, you know, for drums, things that really need to pop. I put a little exciter on the bass here. And again, I'm going to do a, a much more deep dive into the actual plugins themselves. But it's very, very minimal, very minimal, because part of me feels like you don't need to. I, I feel like it's kind of overkill. And believe me, I, I'm subscribed to these channels, and whether it's like the, the Kush channel or uh, In the Mix, and they're all really great. And there's so much amazing information out there just on YouTube. But it becomes very overwhelming for me, very overwhelming, very quickly. And I'm like, oh, this compressor is, I need to use this one for drums and this one's for, for, for vocals, but this one for guitar. And it's just like, rrr, rrr, rrr. and I think, I think it's important to make sure to, to, to keep in mind what we're looking to accomplish here. And something that could work in a studio, in a, in a professional studio, that is looking to release a commercial record and, and may, maybe you can afford the time and you have the luxury to spend, you know, eight hours dialing in a kick and putting all, all these chain upon chain upon chain to try to, to try to, to, to eke out just a fraction of, of, a, of a frequency crisper or clearer frac fractions of a frequency, but you get the idea. And, and I know the sum, you know, small changes do create a larger, big, big change. And I, and I understand that, but looking, you know, looking at the track that we have today, we essentially have harmonica, a couple of melodica layers an, an acoustic upright bass and, uh, for drum mics and that's it. So again, my approach is less is more. I think it was originally driven because I didn't know about all of these processes. I, I, I've since kind of added into my arsenal of, of knowledge and plugins things I could add. But I keep coming back to the plugins when I didn't have a lot, namely like stock logic EQs, stock logic compressors. Uh, and my, my first love, my first mastering love, which was, uh, ozone. I still, I, I still keep coming back to those. My reverbs, I use the, uh, the East West spaces two because it's, it's set. Uh, I have different impulses around the orchestral stage and I just, it all glues together really, really nicely. And so I, I, Try not to just dump things on onto a chain because I should, air quotes, because I saw it in a YouTube video. Instead, I will put the handful of plugins that I know needs, that I know a track needs or a channel needs, and then only add plugins after then if I know I need to address a specific problem. Like throwing a, a, an exciter onto the bass so it could kind of just light up the upper harmonics of my my acoustic bass. So that's that's the first approach. Not really knowing what what is out there, sticking with what I did know, and getting really used to using those, and adding things as needed, not by default. 
And that's especially true if you're dealing with MIDI instruments, because MIDI instruments, you know, they're normalized, the 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 velocities, you know, have very predictable gain. And so if I have a snare drum which is too loud, then I'm not going to throw a limiter on there. I'm just going to go in and adjust the velocity. I can't remember if I've talked about this before, but I do a ton of mixing with velocities, which leads me to my second approach, which is always searching for musical solutions first. Musical solutions to mixing problems or mixing, I don't want to say problems, but mixing challenges, issues, whatever. Always look for musical solutions first. Let's take that snare drum example. I have a MIDI drum set. This week is not a good example because this is all recorded drums. But let's say I have a MIDI, MIDI drum set and I have a snare drum which is too loud. Now, conventional recorded theory would say throw a limiter on there or a compressor to tamp down the transients on the snare drum. And that would be the right call. But when I'm dealing with a MIDI, a virtual instrument, I have the luxury of altering my performance. And so I treat my virtual instruments as virtual musicians. And so by changing the velocity, I'm not just getting... I'm not just getting a quieter performance. I'm not getting a compressed fortissimo sound. I'm, I'm now getting a mezzo forte sound, which for good drum libraries would actually change the timbre of the snare drum. If I were recording live and had the luxury to do a take again, I would tell the drummer, the snare drum is getting too loud in the bridge. I'm going to need you to not play rim shots, or I want you to make sure that you are just keeping... Uh, at a mezzo forte. And the drummer would say, okay, cool, and would get me a, a different take, which would yield a much more musical performance. So instead of just throwing compressors on there to try to tamp things down or glue it together, I'll just use my MIDI and adjust my MIDI to get a different performance. Likewise, if I have, let's say I have a marimba and a piano together, and they're on top of each other. The note, it's just all clumped. You know, my, my technical response is to go in there and EQ everything and carve it all out, maybe throw some frequencies exciters to make the piano light up, and, and so to dump plugins. But that's, that's a technical response. That's an engineer brain approaching an issue. Frequency masking. But if I have the MIDI... There's a musical response to that, which is maybe transpose a couple of notes up the octave, or maybe lower the velocities on those low notes so that they're not on top of each other. So if I approach the, the, the mixing from a compositional standpoint, then I yield much more musical results that are, in my opinion, significantly easier to mix. And that also has to do with my arrangement, or it applies to my arrangement as well. I guess that's, that's kind of the same thing I'm talking about, which is looking at my, 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 my mix as I'm writing, and I think, what else does this need? If I'm looking at the frequency uh, display, I'm like, well, I'm kind of missing some high end. So I'm going to add some high end sounds that I know already isn't going to step on all of these other, these other instruments that are happening. So if I approach the mixing process, especially with virtual instruments, the mixing process from a musical composer brain, and I always search for musical solutions first. And then, then if I can't solve it, with a musical solution, an arrangement, an orchestration solution, then I'll reach for my plugins. I would say the majority of the time I can solve a mixing problem if I have virtual instruments with orchestration and arrangement. Which means, like I said, I don't have to dump tons of plugins. So not really knowing everything I should 
unquote be doing on top of approaching my mix and 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 my 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 master from a musical composer standpoint and you end up with just kind of a handful of plugins and that has its advantage because if i'm looking to create hundreds of cues in a year i i don't have the time or luxury to spend hours and hours dialing in my mix i've got to work fast and i've got to get things published got to get them sent out <laughs> see last week's video <laughs> So Rayburn, thank you so much for the question. I hope I hope that helped. Uh, it's a question that that I have seen from time to time, and I definitely talk about it uh, to my students because, especially like at, at a school like Full Sail, where they are learning, you know, they're learning Pro Tools and they're learning, you know, all the sequencing technology on top of all the music theory side of things. And it just, it, it, they feel like on every single track, they have to like trot out everything. It's like drummers who have a 13 piece kit with double bass drums. And they're going to, they're going to set that drum. They're going to set that kit up at every single gig, even though, even though a kick snare and hi-hat would be fine for the gig, but they're going to trot out their freaking Neil Peart, John Bonham, Terry Bozio giant cage kit and play a wedding gig or something. It's just like that. It's just like that. And maybe my my career as a drummer has taught me that only bring to the gig what you need to play on the gig. So Rayburn, thank you so much for the question. I'm laughing because, yeah, I, I see it all the time with drummers and it's the same thing, the same thing. We get the new toys as composers and producers and we just want to trot them out on every single on every single track. And we just don't have to. It just doesn't call for that. So speaking of track, let's take a look at Grits and Gumbo. This is a cue that uh, was written for a client search looking for kind of gypsy jazz-ish. Some of the references they gave, gave us were like punk gypsy jazz with a uh, kind of almost like a uh, 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 a German influence kind of klezmer type of vibe to it. And I, I've done a couple of other tracks which lean into that. This one has more of a New Orleans feel and I didn't set out to do it. It started as a, blue, as a blues track. It features a really good friend of mine, an amazing bass player here in town named Brandon Miller, who is a jazz player. And he came into the studio. This was this was uh, like the right after Thanksgiving, right at the beginning of that of last week's kind of. Uh, and so I had him in, paid him a little bit of money and uh, for a three hour session. And we just kind of brainstormed grooves and those kind of things. And so this is Grits and Gumbo. We're going to take a listen to it and then I'm going to unpack it on the other side.
was Grits and Gumbo featuring my really good friend Brandon Miller on the upright bass. And what is so unusual about this cue is no, like no MIDI at all. I'm such a MIDI composer and I noticed all of my... <laughs> My drumming insecurities coming out as I'm recording. I don't, I don't I'll hardly do any drum recording at all. Not just because it gobbles up all the all the space in my studio, and I'll have some I'll have some pictures. Fl uh, I'll fly in some pictures of the drum set, but uh, and I didn't actually take any pictures of Brandon uh, when he was recording. But it's just really unusual for me to actually track drum set. Now I can throw like a mic on a snare drum and that kind of thing. I do that that kind of thing all the time and, and percussion, these little one-off things. But to actually set up a multi-mic situation for my drums is very, very unusual. And like I said, it got all my my playing insecurities <laughs> riled up. It's just, it just goes to show you, you know, deep inside so many musicians, no matter how accomplished you get, it's like... You're your own worst critic. Uh, so, so my drums, uh, really simple mic setup because this is kind of a jazz vibe to it. I have two overhead mics, which are uh, the Neumann uh, 184s. I believe they're vintage 184s, which are the uh, the Neumann pencil condenser mics that I've borrowed from a really good friend of mine, a fellow composer uh, or and producer here at Full Sail. And it was really kind enough to let me borrow them over Thanksgiving break because otherwise I would have been using my Samson CO2 pencil condensers, which have served me very, very, very well. And But they're $100 for a pair on Amazon versus the Neumann Vintage. They don't make these anymore. So yeah. So uh, I've got them set up in an XY uh, configuration over the drum set. And um, just just to capture snare drum they're pointed at the snare drum uh, to capture cymbals snare drum and the toms um, as far as the processing I, I, I like the vintage VCA comp uh, compressor this is the logics SSL essentially the SSL and so it is mirrored on both sides as far as the EQs you know uh, Rayborn asked about you know just the low cuts yeah I put low cuts just to clean up the bottom end and I leave the low end for for one sound usually kick or bass or synth or something like that then I get kind of everything else out of the way and then I use complementary EQ curves up the frequency spectrum just to make everything kind of fit together uh, but yeah, because this just mathematically more ways for higher frequencies to kind of blend than there are for low frequencies. So I get really aggressive on the low end and then move it more subtly. Obviously those are panned left and right. Uh, then I have a my Shure SM7B on my kick. It's my kind of my voiceover mic, but I figure if it's good enough for Quincy Jones, it's good enough for me. So uh, so that's what's on the kick. And it's just a really small 18 inch kick. Uh, and this is my Mapex Pro M kit. And then I have a room mic set up, which is the, uh, I wanna make sure I'm in a good spot here, which is my AT2035, uh, just set up kind of right here, like where, where I'm sitting pointed at. Uh, as far as the compressor, let me actually uh, pull that up. As far as the compressor, another uh, the SSL. I just I just like the SSL vibe, and the EQs cutting even more of the low end, bringing a little bit more of of, of the mids or these mid highs, kind of where the snare drum is. And I threw a sample delay on there just to widen it out a little bit. If I were to listen to everything. That's without the room. That's with the room without the sample delay. With the sample delay, it sounds wider. What, what I'm doing is I'm kind of faking a stereo room mic with that. 
by taking a mono mic, putting a sample delay on it. That puts it right down the middle. The sample delay creates kind of a fake Haas effect. So working with just makes thing, everything sounds nice and wide. And then I put one more compressor, which is a uh, like a, a FET type mic, uh, uh, um, compressor. And this is a modeled off of a very fancy, it's like a DBX compressor or something like that. See, that's, that's you, you've reached the edge of the map of what I know about this stuff. I know just enough to sound really dangerous, but uh, that's, the, that's the edge of the map for me. Um, just some light compression to, to, to quote, quote unquote, kind of glue it together, just, just to mush it down. The other FET is the Studio FET, which I think this is a modeled off of a UA. It's a very famous kind of drum compressor. It sounded over, overly compressed for me. So, and then put another drum uh, EQ on. And I keep coming back to stock Logic EQs for one reason. I'm such a visual person. I love, love being able to see all of my EQs at once. Like I can see where I need to cut and I'm and I'm and, and where my complementary EQ curves kind of fit together like puzzle pieces. Very, very visual. It's one of the reasons I liked Reason early on. And then when Logic 10 replaced Logic 9, it got into this look. And so I've, I'm all on board. If I need to tackle specific EQing issues, then I'll usually get into my fab filter. And I use that a lot with uh, vocal processing, specifically spoken audio, podcast produ production, audiobooks, and that kind of thing, where I need I need to be able to like isolate and sweep and find like a, a room tone or something that I have to isolate out. Okay. So next up, we have the bass. My good friend Brandon Miller is playing that. I've done a ton of theater work with him, and uh, he's just a fabulous bass player. This is my, uh, my AT2035 large diaphragm microphone pointed more at the fingers because I wanted the, uh, the, the attack of that. Uh, as far as the EQs, rolled off around 50 hertz or so, just on the, the very low end, and took out some of the mids. I want a little bit more of the highs there, and this was kind of like trial and error. I did watch a handful of videos on uh, on EQing jazz bass. I haven't done a ton of upright bass recording, and so yeah, I watched some tutorial videos just to kind of get get my head around it. The compressor on there is the the ss uh the ssl type compression not not a ton you know just a two to one but i did throw on my uh some a little bit of tape saturation just to get a little bit a little, little bit of brightness to that And that is going into the uh, the East West Spaces, which is the Reynolds Hall, and this is specifically going to the low strings section. The drums are going into the percussion section of the Reynolds Hall, and I do have some parallel compression using the one knob. I just I just really love the one knob series. This is without the parallel. With the parallel. This really, really helps drums pop. And then we get into my uh, harmonica work and my melodica work. Uh, this is me playing this, this guy right here. Um, just standard blue stuff. And this is a diatonic harmonica, specifically a, a MS Blues harp. And this was recorded 
right into my, this is my AT20, um, I'm sorry, my RE320 microphone that I use for voiceover and for my podcast production. And I literally, you know, just, just did it right in here. I tried my silver, my silver bullet. This is what I usually do for, for blues harmonica. This gives it a, a really kind of dirty, distorted type sound, even uh, ran it through my, uh, my Joyo pedal. And I wonder if I have, no, I don't have any takes of that, but it sounded, it sounded really good, but it was, it was too gritty. It was too distorted, too dark. And so I've, with the upright bass, the jazz drums, I needed to lean more into a more acoustic sound. And so I opted for like no distortion at all. This is going into the violin, violin spaces with a delay, which is just stock logic delay. Uh, as far as the compressor, using the vintage opto, uh, which is an optical compressor. And that usually is saved for like kind of overarching kind of mastering glue, but I liked it. I liked it on there. So it's a typical blues form, a uh, little intro, make my statement. And then, um, then the second time around, Brandon opens up in the bass, really starts digging in. The drums really dig in. So instead of just swinging, kind of doing like a, a halftime groove. And then I layer in, I layer in Melodica, which is one of these guys just here playing the melody along with the harmonica, which was a challenge because with the harmonica, you can really lean into those bent blue notes, but the melodica, you really can't bend the notes. Uh, and this is when it really took on its New Orleans vibe. So there's an octave up and then an octave below, which I retract. Pan them just a little bit, just some light panning. With the harmonica though. Oh, and by the way, the second time through, I went from single notes to uh, more like double and triple notes. which gave it the squeeze box vibe, you know? And so it feels like almost like an accordion or a concertina or something. So, so that carries through into the kind of the, the, re, the recap as it comes in for a landing. Do I, oh, I have, let me see. Would love to show you some of that really just, oh, I do have the distorted stems. Okay, uh, that is my. Don't mind me while I. It just has a... Yeah, it, it's, it's, it's too blues traveler-y, uh, if you will. And so uh, that was, I think that was the right, right call there. So I'm much happier, much happier with that. So that is, uh, that is Grits and Gumbo. That is my mixing approach. Less is absolutely more. I don't know what I don't know, but I, I would love to hear about your mixing approach. And I'm always, always open to suggestions and always wanting to learn more things. But that's going to do it for me today. Thank you so much. And I need to give a special word of thanks to my Patreon patrons whose support helps keep this channel happening. 
Uh, to be a patron, it's just $1 a month, and uh, not only do you get the satisfaction of helping keep things going, but you also get access to my weekly music production live stream. So if that's something you're interested in, you can check out the Patreon information below. If not, if you just want to watch the video and enjoy it and receive, that's cool too, guys. But that's going to do it for me. I hope you had a good week 48, and I look forward to seeing you next week for my week 49. We're, we're coming up to the end of our 52. But, uh, but yeah, guys, have a fantastic week. Until next time, peace. peace.